So as you can probably see from the state of my office, it's been a very, very hectic few weeks. Um, we're in a bit of a mess here. Um, on top of the fact I've been really busy at work, I've been going out and giving quite a lot of schools lectures. And on top of doing that, half the students here have been collapsing with swine flu, um, which is going around like wildfire. And I thought what I'd do is talk a little bit about swine flu today, and flu in general, and how it gets treated. And to do that, I thought we'd take a little look at one of the clips from my lectures, which explains the basis of how drugs have been developed to treat influenza. Influenza is a serious killer disease. In the influenza outbreak of 1918, the so-called Spanish flu killed more people than the whole of the First World War had killed. This is a serious disease that causes serious problems in the population. So flu's been in the news a lot recently because a swine flu virus jumped into the human population and was shown to easily transmit from person to person. This is a big problem. A new flu virus comes into the human population. It can cause potentially large problems. And although the swine flu virus, which started in Mexico and has spread through the world, has been a bad pandemic and many people have suffered symptoms of swine flu, Fortunately, it's been reasonably mild. And one of the things that's helped to control swine flu is the presence of new drugs such as Tamiflu, one of the things we're going to think about in this video. In the lecture, I explain that enzymes are essential in biological systems. Enzymes are the catalysts that allow reactions to occur in a biological system. And if we can understand how an enzyme reacts with a small chemical substrate, then we can understand how biology operates. Now, the way in which an enzyme interacts with a small molecule is like the way in which a lock interacts with a key. You can imagine the enzyme behaving like the lock and the small chemical molecule behaving like the key. The key goes into the lock and something happens, in this case a chemical reaction. And that's because there are complementary interactions between the lock and the key, such as hydrogen bonding and electrostatic interactions. And if we can understand and control those interactions, then we can find ways by which a chemical system can intervene in a biological process. We can design a key for the lock. And to show the principle of the lock and key hypothesis in action, I demonstrate an experiment where we look at enzyme reactivity using the reaction between liver and hydrogen peroxide. So what I want to see is how the chemical interacts with the biological. So what we'll do is we'll add the hydrogen peroxide to the liver and we'll see what happens. Well, what you can see is that there's definitely a reaction between the two in this case. There's a lot of frothing. We're giving off a gas. The gas being given off in this case is oxygen. We're breaking down the hydrogen peroxide to oxygen and water. What is doing this? What is actually breaking down the hydrogen peroxide? Well, it's enzymes in the liver, our biological lock, if you like. It's breaking down the hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. So hydrogen peroxide comes along, it fits perfectly into the lock, and it gets converted into oxygen by the enzyme which is called catalase, as some of you probably know, that's present in high quantities in liver. So that's nice. Let's take a second sample of the liver then. But this one has been soaked in copper sulfate. Now you can soak it just for a few hours, but this has been soaked for quite a while. And those of you at the front, you can probably see it looks kind of greeny blue in colour now. So this is liver that's been treated in copper. And we're going to do exactly the same experiment. We're just going to take our hydrogen peroxide and we're going to add it to the liver and see what happens. And stopper it up. Give it a swirl. And you can see absolutely nothing happens when we've soaked the liver in copper sulfate solution. So why not? Well, a key part of the catalase enzyme, the lock in this system,
has iron in it. It's an iron-rich enzyme. When we soak it in copper, we replace the iron with copper. And what this means is that the enzyme doesn't work anymore. Essentially, the copper blocks the catalase and stops it from converting the hydrogen peroxide into oxygen. We have a name for this concept in biological chemistry. We call this inhibition. The copper inhibits the activity of the enzymes in the liver. So what? We can turn off the liver. We can make a liver work or not work. Well, the thing is, what about if this wasn't a liver? What about if in this vessel I had a virus and we could turn a virus on and off? Then we'd have a way of controlling a viral infection. And this is exactly how new drugs can be discovered. So this is exactly what was done for the influenza virus. And you're looking here at the structure of one of the key enzymes involved in the influenza virus. It's called neuraminidinase, and it's very important in the way influenza moves from cell to cell. Enzymes are large biological molecules, and so we're going to zoom in to the centre of that biological molecule. And when we get there, you can see there's a small chemical molecule inside the active site of this enzyme. This chemical molecule has been designed by chemists on a computer to fit perfectly in the active site of the neuraminidinase enzyme. You can see the shape of the molecule is such that it really fits in that active pocket. The functional groups are also perfectly matched. Look at the red carboxylate group, negatively charged, in the bottom right hand corner. It's interacting with a blue, positively charged pocket on the enzyme. Whilst the blue, positively charged nitrogen towards the back of the uh, inhibitor molecule is binding to a red, negatively charged pocket in the enzyme active site. That molecule perfectly fits in the active site and blocks the active site of that enzyme. That stops the influenza virus from working and it stops it from infecting and moving from cell to cell. So what was that small molecule that I said was designed on a computer to fit perfectly inside the active site of an influenza enzyme? Well, it's Tamiflu. That's the drug that the government has stockpiled so that when influenza outbreaks come, they can give this drug to people with early stage symptoms and it lowers the infectiveness of the influenza virus and it causes the symptoms to be less damaging to the patient. And if we look in detail at the interactions between the Tamiflu and the enzyme, we can see them here in this picture. What's shown in this picture is Tamiflu, the drug, in red, and part, just a part, of the complicated structure of that enzyme in blue. And what you can see are interactions, for example, between the carboxylate group of Tamiflu in red with the positively charged units at the top of the enzyme structure. Negative attracts positive. Whilst the positively charged protonated amine in red on the left hand side is interacting with three negatively charged carboxylate groups. And so there's a complementarity. The Tamiflu sits perfectly inside that enzyme and switches it off. If you're a chemist, you might like to think about concepts like PKAs. What's the PKAs of the functional groups in Tamiflu? Why does it have a negative charge and a positive charge under physiological conditions? You might also like to think about how Relenza differs to Tamiflu. These questions and more I'll be looking at in the follow-up video to this one. Given how serious a disease like influenza can be, drugs like Tamiflu are a real godsend to the world community, and it's the power of chemistry that has made drugs like Tamiflu possible. Thank you.